right, hello everybody. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, Renee Garcia out here uh, asked me several months back when I was meeting with them in the division office to uh, come back and talk a little bit about something called performance-based practical design. Before I get started, though, I want to ask or, or tell you guys a little story about, I, I flew in from Atlanta this morning. There's a little sign on the side of uh, 280 or 290 that comes from uh, Houston over uh, towards Austin. And it said five words. It was a, a black on white sign, so it was a regulatory sign. It said, obey warning signs, obey law. And so every time I came upon a, a curve that had an advisory speed on it, I would slow down to 35 miles an hour and everybody started honking the horn at me because it said, obey the signs, obey the law. I didn't quite understand that. So after I'm done today, if anybody can explain to me what that sign says, it basically made all the uh, warning signs in the state uh, regulatory, I'd appreciate knowing. But on a more serious note, uh, I really should give my time to Karen because I think her topic is much more important than what I'm going to be talking about. But uh, hopefully I'll lead into some of the things that she'll be talking about. I'm certainly looking forward to, to hearing what Karen's got to talk about. But I'm going to give you guys a quick overview of uh, performance-based practical design. Hopefully you've heard of something called practical design. Federal Highways is working on something that's a little bit different. Uh, we have tried to distinguish our uh, effort and our emphasis on something that involves performance basis. The same end goals uh, we, we expect people to try to achieve and, and realize, but we need to, to try to implement and promote the use of performance analysis tools, the use of quantitative information, relevant information and data to help make our decision making uh, more robust. Uh, you guys can all see here, these are kind of just little pictures to tell you what kind of challenges uh, Texas is facing. Even though I've never seen so much construction in a long, long time than I saw in the Houston area coming out from the airport. Um, very impressive. We still don't have enough money to build our way out of our problems. And so we believe that by promoting performance-based practical design that states are going to be able to find opportunities to leverage their programs to get more out of it. And I'll explain how and why. Among all the challenges that you guys are facing, there's probably nothing more difficult to overcome than the culture in the department that itself. Uh, everybody in this room right now is facing uh, a big challenge. We have to change. We have to change because there's information now telling us that we don't really know what we think we've known. We are finding information that's telling us that we were wrong. And I'll explain a little bit about that here in a few minutes. And so the old model, the, the way I was brought into the system, uh, where you get one of the more senior guys that's got the patience to deal with some smart aleck kid, uh, you know, to tell me how this, you know, he or she would do things, I was supposed to follow their role. And I was supposed to do, you know, lock, stop, everything just the way he did. We can't do that anymore. We've got to think differently and we've got to push people to start doing things differently because we just simply cannot continue on the path that we're on. So what is performance-based practical design? Well, there is nothing that defines performance-based practical design. It can be a little bit of everything. And I, I'm a little bit, um, I guess I, I have a little regret that we use the term performance-based practical design as opposed to performance-based project development or perhaps performance-based program delivery because it is not a design uh, topic at all. What I've been working on deals with the designers uh, primarily, but it's really more about what this is. It's trying to take advantage of the decision-making process to help agencies better manage their investments and looking at our purchases and our construction projects and the performance we should get out of it. Uh, I hope that's not an omen. The crickets <laughs> chirping. We're off to a bad start, but luckily the day is almost over. <laughs> but the goal is, is that this is designed to help agencies do more in any given year with their finite resources to improve their systems beyond what they can without it. And I think you'll see some examples uh, where, you, where this is going to uh, hopefully uh, interest you uh, into learning more about it. Uh, first of all, Federal Highway Administration, as I work for them, um, I just want to make sure everybody understands this is not going to be a policy. We're not out here trying to create a policy on this. I will talk about a proposed policy change to the 13 controlling criteria in a few minutes. Uh, but we're not here to push this on anybody. Well, excuse me, we're not here to make anybody do anything. This sells itself. This is just good engineering. Um, so it's not going to be a policy, a regulation, or requirement. We're not trying to also 
uh, invite agencies to take advantage of data uh, to simply advance projects that have a very narrow uh, or short-term focus. We still need to be um, smart about what we're doing and we need to look beyond our current tenure. We need to look at the future and what is going to be happening. You know, maybe we'll have less cars maybe in the future, maybe the cars will be driving themselves, who knows. Uh, but we've got to be open-minded to what's going to be happening in the future. And perhaps more than anything else, you know, Federal Highways is, is trying to change the model a little bit and trying to push uh, the engineering culture in a certain direction, hopefully in a good direction, uh, but we are not trying to suggest that we want to compromise on safety, uh, on accommodating uh, non-motorized users. That's certainly a, a fundamental um, position for federal highways and an accommodation of freight. Uh, the easiest way to save money on projects is to reduce the width or the thickness of your pavement, but that's not going to stand up for trucks. And the, the more and more freight we've got, we just simply can't do that kind of thing. So we've got a couple of of uh, fences, if you will, uh, or boundaries. Now, in, in a short, very short definition uh, or some examples of some of the highlights of what we're talking about, performance-based practical design is essentially trying to look at your project decisions with a more critical examination of the geometric elements. And what I mean by uh, critical examination is trying to understand how the relationship of the physical size of the choices we're making, uh, it's easy to relate them to cost, but how does it relate to performance? That's the real key. If we can find elements that occupy space that we can reduce or eliminate because they don't have an effect on performance, then those are the kinds of things that we want to identify because we want to propose to eliminate them. If there's no real utility or value, let's not build it and let's save that money. Let's invest that money elsewhere where we have a higher return on the investment. We want agencies and engineers to try to do more and use more relevant and objective information in their decision making. This information can go a long way and I'll show you some examples in a few minutes uh, of how this information is changing uh, the, the, the way um, that we're viewing our policies at Federal Highways. Um, and ultimately we're trying to make uh, choices that will serve your project priorities, whether it's safety, mobility, uh, trying to rebuild failing infrastructure, et cetera, uh, moving to uh, other forms of transportation, uh, but do so at a lower cost. There's two states I'll just mention real quick. Indiana's uh, made a commitment to their legislature. They're going to deliver 100% of their program at 90% of the cost, five-year program. Washington State thought that was such a good idea. They went to their legislature and secured a funding bill and said, we're going to deliver 100% of the program at 80% of the cost. Now, I never thought that you could trim 20% of the fat off a program. I've never seen a project that I thought we could take 20% out of, but I've, I've come to realize it absolutely can happen if we start to evaluate our priorities differently. Once we elevate certain elements to higher priorities, then certain things can fall off, and we can do without certain things. Uh, and that's how these states are doing it. Ultimately, though, we're seeing this being a tie between project-level decision-making and trying to relate that to our system priorities and our needs so that when we save money on projects that accumulates to some kind of a uh, real uh, investment opportunity elsewhere in the system. So we're looking at projects, we're looking at system. Uh, we are trying to use this performance analysis as the basis of our decisions and we are trying to understand uh, not only how these decisions made, uh, make a difference in terms of the, 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 the cost, uh, and the performance, but also in terms of value and urgency. Uh, we also have to take into uh, consideration, you know, the public. You know, sometimes some certain things are just, uh, we can't do certain things, or we have to do certain things uh, because of public controversy. And so this isn't a shortcut to NEEP or anything else, but ultimately it's trying to make smarter decisions. It's a buzzword right now, performance-based practical design. It is what it is, and tomorrow it'll be the next one. It is one of uh, a large suite of tools that uh, you all have, whether it's context sensitive solutions, value engineering, whatever you want to call it, uh, but it's, just, it's sort of the new buzzword right now. Uh, but the big takeaway again is this is all about trying to find new ways uh, to do more for our system performance and it all gets down to that banner ribbon at the bottom. This is all about what our system metrics are at the end of the year. So I'll run you through a couple of quick examples to demonstrate what I see as a good way to explain what performance based practical design. Here's, I'm going to give you two Two projects told the old way and now the performance-based practical design way. And you guys tell me which one sounds better. Two-lane railroad out in somewhere, I won't tell you where, 
uh, project engineer in front of about 70 managers and higher in the state DOT, gave this presentation that goes, you know, we basically had this nine foot lanes and three foot shoulders and we had to build to full standards and the full standards just were too expensive. So we ended up cutting it back to 11 foot lanes and two foot paved shoulders, which is the same type of typical you're gonna see on the next example. And they went through all these different elements of how we, we, we started with the 12 foot lane and we reduced it down to 11 feet. We started with the four foot shoulders, we reduced it down to three or two feet. And he, and he went through all this stuff and he said, and we were able to save $4.15 million. And the guy got a standing ovation from 70 engineers, managers and up, supervisors and up in the state. And when he handed me the microphone back, they asked me to, to, to what do you think? And I said, I'm embarrassed to say this, but I really wish you had told that story very differently. I am, as a safety engineer first, I am already against everything you just said because the way you'd said it. You didn't talk about the safety analysis, the performance analysis of this. You just talked about cost savings. You talked about moving from a standard back to something less than standard. But if you told the story is you had nine foot lanes and you were expanding them and improving them to 11 feet, which is what you were doing, just telling that story differently, I would have not been put on my heels and wanting to go against you. I would have wanted to go with you uh, because you're gonna be talking about the value. And so here's another example. This is obviously a road that needs some improvement. Same kind of problem, narrow, terrible pavement. They needed to build a full standards. The department said, you don't get $67 million to do these 23 miles. You're getting 25, tell us what you can get for it. So this was a design to budget type of a problem, which started the engineering path and the project development path very differently than what we traditionally do. But what they came back with was, for $25 million, we can improve crash performance on every segment of that 23 miles by at least reducing, by at least 10% if not greater. And they had other metrics to go along with it. Now they ended up with the exact same kind of a typical section, something that did not meet standards. But they didn't focus on the fact that we're not gonna go to full standards, we're gonna reduce it back to get from 67 million down to 25. They said, we're gonna improve, we're gonna build upon the existing, and this investment is going to get this kind of a return, and this is better than doing nothing because we can't do the 67 million dollar project. This is sort of a, a difference in the way that we communicate, and we leverage the power of performance analysis uh, to help support our decision making. Here's another example, and I'm gonna walk you through this and, and you guys can all test yourselves. I'm basically gonna look at a freeway expansion going with uh, basically a 60 foot section in each direction. Three 12 foot lanes, two 12 foot shoulders, and then we're gonna try to squeeze a lane into it. And now I want you guys to tell me what you think is gonna be the best performing one. So here's our starting no build option. Five 12 foot lanes, basically three lanes and two sh shoulders. Option one would be to put two 11s and two 12s with a four foot left inside shoulder and a 10 foot outside shoulder. How about four 11 foot lanes and two eight foot shoulders? A six foot inside and 10 foot outside, a four foot inside and a 12 foot outside, or a two foot inside shoulder and a 14 foot outside shoulder. Now I want you guys to all think about this. Which one of these is gonna perform the best? We'll walk through the answer here in just a second. I'll show it to you. Because what I can tell you is, in certain areas like that project we just saw Pat talk about, sometimes widening means taking out one of your most important businesses. I mean, that, 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 that elevated ramp that was right next to that big building, you're never gonna touch that. This money is real big, big time dollars here. And, and so if we can find ways to look at squeezing another lane in, maybe that performance analysis is gonna be what it's gonna take to get us there. So you tell me, this is the overall predicted crash performance of these five different alternatives plus the full 12 foot. I know you guys can't really read this, but look at the colors. In the column, blue is good, red is bad, meaning blue is the lowest number and the red is the highest. So do you think that that number five is the worst one? Do you think that those are the worst kind of crashes? That's the one you're gonna wanna stay away from? Yes or no, you've got a 50-50 chance. Stay away from it, right? Okay, well, let's, let's walk through this. So, if we look at the other crash statistics, which are important, Ks are fatalities. At least one person's gonna be uh, killed. We see that it's one of the lowest. The As means that there's at least one disability, uh, disabling injury that's gonna occur. We see that both four and five are among the lowest. B means at least one evident non-disabling injury and we see that these are among the lowest. And then for a possibility of an injury, we still see that these are among the lowest. 
And then if we look at property damage only crashes, this is where this number was artificially changed and it influenced. I'll tell you right now, we, we're not as much, we don't care as much about property damage only crashes from a safety point of view. Absolutely from a non-recurring congestion point of view and a, and a system reliability point of view, it matters. But when we're looking at safety alone, these numbers absolutely matter. These columns matter and they change the way that we understand this. Now, if you have the ability to save 100 or, or $200 million a mile to go to something like alternative four or five, as opposed to doing a full build, Shouldn't we be thinking and trying to look at that and trying to, to see if we can make that kind of case? Because $200 million invested elsewhere in the system might save us a lot of other problems. It might help us build our way out of some other serious, serious issues. Uh, issues. So which one would you choose? Here's another example about how performance tools can help us. I like this example because it does something that I've never seen before. It justifies the build of a brand new interchange. Case study, and, and, and basically this is where they're proposing an interchange to service this area, and this was the evaluation of without the interchange where they had to improve the local system roads. And what this analysis using the interactive highway safety design model, which is a software tool, a very, very good tool that implements uh, the, 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 the fundamentals, if you will, of the highway safety manual, the safety performance functions. What, this, what the results of this were showed that without the interchange, the overall crashes were higher the serious injury and fatal crashes versus with the interchange. This made a case for why to put an interchange on the interstate. And now I know it sounds a little fishy for federal highways to be up here talking about how to justify a new access point on the interstate, but it's the power of the data. This data is very, very powerful. One last example real quick. How many of you have ever worked on a design exception for cross slope? How many of you have ever tried to, or how many of you think that you could work out a design exception for cross slope on a freeway. So what if you had uh, to resurface all of your freeways and you didn't have cross slope, which is a reality in some states. You don't just want to have to do a full uh, uh, reconstruction or a major mill and fill to correct cross slope when all you need is a functional restoration of the surface or a preventive maintenance project, right? So how do you get through this? Through the power of data. This project here stopped the entire preventive maintenance program in an entire state. A chief engineer got fired over this. And what we found, what we went out and did is we said, you know, we're going to look at the possibility of approving a design exception for cross slope, but we have to have the data to show it. And through our review and analysis, we noticed something that was out there. It just happened to rain. We just happened to see this car crash in front of us, which was a little bit embarrassing for the state because they wanted to get their program rolling. Uh, but we saw the rutting. And so we, we knew that it didn't have a cross slope, but we also knew that there was a rutting problem. And so what tells us whether or not we have to fix this? Is it a cross slope problem that we need to fix or not? And we can look at data, but what we wanted to solve was hydroplane. The data using LIDAR, uh, light uh, detection arranging, uh, you guys hopefully are all familiar with it, can do a pretty good map. If you use a, a stationary LIDAR, you can get a pretty accurate representation of the physical features of the surface, the surface profile three-dimensionally. You can model the water flow characteristics. You can look at the drainage path lengths that are within the travel way. And those drainage path lengths can be related to the speeds at which we would predict hydroplaning. So we can come up with the ways that if it wasn't the rutting and it was a cross slope, maybe there's only certain small sections that need to be corrected. It's a whole lot cheaper than taking an entire uh, series of freeway projects and correcting cross slope. This is kind of what the modeling would look like. These are drainage uh, where the water is running down the lanes. And when you're trying to correct cross slope, it's a very complicated project. Those of you who've worked in construction, trying to get uh, th this corrected here meant that one side of the road had to be 12 inches higher than the other. That's, that's a lot to get to 2%. And it's more complicated when you have bridges. So it was a non-starter. The budget wasn't there. And we were able to come up with ways to analyze this and then predict uh, the hydroplating potential, which was not, it was related to cross slope, but it was not because it was about the performance. We even came up with an innovative solution where you don't, maybe don't want to go out there and correct it. Why not post it with dynamic speed control? Why not mitigate your consequences when it rains? Put some speed limits on those roads that will slow people down because you predicted at the speeds at which you would expect them to have the potential to hydroplane. This was an engineering solution that was avoiding a lot of expenditure for something like cross slope. One more thing I want to plug real quick and I'll hopefully have a couple of minutes for questions, but risk and uncertainty. Another thing that we absolutely must start to address in our 
use of objective information is that we have error in many of the things that we're doing. And we need to start to address this because we're making major, major, major investments. Pat's pro project, I think you said the number six billion. That's a big, big investment. And we have to make sure that we understand what the ramifications are if our assumptions are off. So if you take these four features, your traffic data, your predicted crashes, your user cost, and just the cost of materials alone, these things all are either accurate or less accurate to some degree. We just need to try to understand by how much. Because if we calculate a, a, a benefit cost to our investment, and it, we, we, we use this number to summarize all of this as how good this project is, what we don't know without trying to look at this is whether or not that that benefit cost, if we try to represent it with the normal distribution, is dead smack in the middle, or if it's way off to one side of the tail. And if it is, we've got an 89% chance that we're going to be wrong in this case that we're going to be wrong, that our project is not going to perform, it's going to underperform. And when we're investing in projects that are $6 billion, $1 billion, $300 million, we ought to be using data and trying to analyze these things so that we understand to what kind of extent we may be taking a chance at a risk. I mean, think about the big dig. When we first estimated that project, it wasn't $14, $15, $16 billion. We were, we were wrong on that. We want to understand what alternatives have a shape more like this and hopefully choose those. Here is what it boils all down to. If you think about any project, you are looking at something in relationship to standards oftentimes. And oftentimes you're picking something that's right at or right about the, st the standards. We want you to look for options and we want you to understand the relationship between the cost and the performance value, whatever that performance value may be. Because if you can find an option and it has a different performance value curve, you have three choices now. You can build your original, you can build one that has, for the same cost, better value, or for less cost, the same value. Forget whether or not that includes a design exception. This is finding ways to either increase value for the same amount of money, or get the same value for less cost. That's a win-win. Which one would you choose? So going back to this, I'll take you to the next step. So what if we start to look at the temporal effects of freeway performance and crashes, temporal meaning environmental? And we started to understand that when people are in congested environments, they can't travel very fast. And when speeds are down, your chances of getting injured or killed are less. What if this num these numbers started to prove to be true? Maybe, maybe just maybe, we ought to be looking at something like option number five that runs on the shoulder during peak congested periods. We can move and address our momentarily or our portion of the day that has congestion problems and then bring it back to a shoulder for the remainder of the day for the safety benefits when the speeds are higher. You have major decisions in front of you with major costs and you don't have enough money to do that, so we have to start looking at more out-of-the-box solutions. Federal Highways right now is getting close to publishing a new guide on, uh, is basically in support of performance-based practical design about how to analyze shoulder use, uh, part-time shoulder use. I don't know if it's going to look like this. Uh, or if it's going to look like this, but I know that we're in the process of getting it out. I think that you're going to really enjoy uh, the information in there because there's a lot more in it, and it uses a lot of substantive information and predictive information, uh, leveraging the Highway Safety Manual and other tools to understand how you can improve travel time uh, index or reliability without necessarily sacrificing your safety performance. And I think that there's an opportunity to save a ton of money uh, if the data shows us that this is not an unnecessary risk or an unacceptable risk. A couple of key reports I want you guys to all be familiar with. If you haven't read NCHRP Report 783, you absolutely need to. This is a foundational report that's going to change the future of geometric design as we know it. It already is. And I'll tell you why in a second. But this is talking about the performance or evaluation of the 13 controlling criteria for geometric design. What data says that our geometric criteria are appropriate. So Federal Highways, if you guys haven't heard yet, has proposed in the Federal Register, has asked for comments back to propose to change our rules about what we call our 13 controlling criteria. It came out last week. It closes on December 7th. And the good news is, is I'm going to tell you a little bit about it so that you guys will whet your appetite and you guys can get on the register and hopefully you'll comment uh, because we certainly want to hear from everybody. Here's what's being proposed. We're proposing to eliminate three criteria. Bridge width, vertical alignment, and lateral offset to obstruction. Can I get a hooray or something? It's, 
this is a big step. Who's, this has been 1985, we've had 13 controlling criteria, and now we're talking about the possibility of it going down to 10. We're also changing horizontal alignment to horizontal curve radius, we're changing grade to maximum grade, and we're changing structural capacity to design loading structural capacity. This is a very, very big deal, and this is coming from things like NCHRP Report 783 because we are seeing the data does not necessarily support applying the rules the way we have in the past. And so now we're starting to apply performance, and that's what we want your comments on. So here basically is what the new table would look like, and except for the first and the last one, these would only apply on roadways on the NHS with the 50 mile per hour or higher design speed. It's a pretty big deal. The uh, design speed and design loading structural capacity, though, will apply to all roads in the NHS. And last but not least, go to regulations.gov and try to, to, to read this. It's very, very important, and we really want everybody's comments. But please get them in by December 7th, if at all possible. Last but not least, on a good note, we want to be a good partner. We're not trying to push this out and make people do anything. We believe this is going to be something that's going to draw, uh, draw you all in on its own. And we want to be a good partner and help anyone and everyone we can. Renee, we're here to help you guys here in Texas as much as we can. And uh, we're, we're, we're doing a lot of help for around the country. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. And I think we've got just a minute or two, no minutes, for questions. I'll stick around till after Karen's. I don't want to take any time away from Karen because she's got a better presentation than mine. <laughs>